Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Sandy and Ken Hour. This is the Open Metal Hour, where everybody is invited to hang out with us and talk about all kinds of topics that range from our personal insides to what we could do to the outside, meaning how we can help the planet, help people around us, and help each other. This whole hour is an open dialogue, and like I said, invite your friends into this. Today, I am going to start with a topic that starts like this. Okay. Do you know what? You've heard of the Fortune 500 before, right? Yes. Those are the 500 companies that Fortune Magazine deems to be the companies that are moving in a powerful position. Mm -hmm. It's interesting when you look at the Fortune 500, on the 500 companies, there's only 37 CEOs that are what? Still alive? No, 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 no. no, no. no. You asked that question. That are women. So. Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> 37 women of the Fortune 500 companies. So you ask the question, why aren't women in that dominant position? Now, I want you to think about the COVID times that are going on right now. The countries that have the least spread of COVID. And you look at New Zealand, you look at Germany, Finland, you look at primarily countries that are run by women. They have the slowest spread, if anything, they have stopped the spread of COVID like Iceland, and they're all run by women. Mm -hmm. And we asked the question, if women are running countries real, real well, why can't they run companies? That's true. Hmm. Hmm. Like yeah. that. You like this topic? And the reason why? Because us men don't allow them to. That's true. We're in their way. Mm -hmm. We're in their way of running companies. Now, I have run in companies that are run by women and with men. And I realize that women are great at getting the company to the next level. So the scrappiness of a company, the stuff that's like, ugh, the grind, that's not really the best place for a woman. It's kind of like walking into a home that already has all the walls, and the woman goes, okay, let me show what we're going to do with it. Let the guy build it. And the women then walk in when the foundation's laid to make it great. Yes. Do you like this idea? So you're saying the men build the foundation and the women are only good for decorating? No, I didn't say that. I'm saying I believe the scrappiness of building it is probably better on the guy's side where the women walk in to take it to the next level. But Gillette's going, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, I'm just saying I believe that you could unmute yourself, Gillette. You have power. Go ahead. I have the power. I can't lift my arm. I hurt myself. I'm scrappy. And I'm the one who, at the, at the ground level, like building grocery stores, ground level, I'm in charge. No, you don't build the store. You don't go off and put the walls up. You don't dig yeah. the foundation. Oh, you mean the actual business part? I'm talking about the scrappy of really the, found, the, the hard, like, ugh. The manual labor. I don't. I, it's not manual labor. He's not talking about manual labor. because no, 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 I'm, I'm saying yeah. that you start, any one of us that's in a startup, and when you guys watch this, we have the second most watched show after Quigley, just to say. That's true. I believe every company that I've been involved, involved with, maybe 40 of them, the scrappiness of the business, the tireless nights, the, the, the tough that I think age men the most mm. is at that entry, very beginning starting level, is probably not the best place to have a woman CEO. But once all that crap is done, you bring a woman CEO in or a woman to run it, it goes so much farther. That's I get, this is And I get you now. Yeah. I get you now because you're talking about paper. You're talking about putting things on paper. You're talking about pulling in what, need, what we need to get to, from ground level, not the physical ground level, but the paper ground level, right? The What's on paper? Funding of the business. Exactly the, that. Uh, okay. The, I'll setting agree. up what the direction is going to be. All of the crap ass work, I think us guys are, it's the hunting part. There I think go. once it's put together, yeah. the women are by far better to say, you know what, I see it all now. Let me now turn it into whatever's next. I and agree I with you at, now. And I look at like New Zealand. New Zealand's a great example. Tough country. Most people don't know that. The Maoris, you know, they, they used to eat people as of, 60 years ago, they were still cannibals. Ugh. Yeah, most people know. But Maoris were tough. The, 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 the fighting that was going on, and all of a sudden, the last prime minister got, got, kind of got things straightened up, and then all of a sudden, the one that runs New Zealand now, she's a rock star. She's got the foundation. 
she's brought everyone together. There's cohesiveness. Everyone follows her. Same thing in Iceland. I think Germany's got some tough struggles, but I think Angela Merkel is probably the best leader for it. I'm just looking at women, and I'm not trying to say we have to almost say this fits in this peg, this fits in this hole, and that's it. You know, there's, there's you know, um, shapes and sizes, and you have to follow that pattern. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying what I've experienced. This is Ken Rakowski's experience, okay? I just got to preface that. Now, I have been in about 30 to 40 companies. So I've had seen tons of companies. Actually, through Founder Institute, I launched over 200 companies. And I realized the companies that started with guys on the scrappy level did well. But if they didn't have a, a, a woman touch later on, they had a hard time moving forward. That makes sense. Okay. I really believe that, especially now since we're at a global level, women have the buying power way more than men. They make more decisions. If there's not a woman involved, same thing in a church, by the way, think about churches that are run primarily only by men. And then think about religious organizations that have women involved. There's song, there's dance, there's color, there's flavor, there's equality. I think that the scrappy, now guys, I'm opening this up for dialogue, okay? This is all dialogue. Michael, you're looking at me like a stared look going, I don't know what to say. <laughs> this is a third rail, I don't wanna to touch it. Boom! What do you think, Michael? Am I, am I far off? Again, I'm not trying to be a sexist. I just, I, I'd love to get your point of views. What do you think? Uh, it, it definitely speaks into, you know, the saying that's uh, give a woman a house and she'll give you a home, you know, kind of deal. Um, you know, give a woman um, way, ingredients. And, I can vouch for that. Oh, one. absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that's your gig, right? Yeah. So uh, I agree. I agree. Um, I, I, I think it's cool because women add this, you know, they can add some nuance that whereas men kind of like we're so singer singularly focused on just the results and the and the and the profits and the business and the da 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 like like style and and flair and you know those little nuances we don't always see you know i was watching the movie 300 with my son the other day and in 300 if you remember Spartans, where where yeah. the king looks over to his wife to get approval to move forward on certain decisions and it showed the dynamic of where she saw everything mm. like yes do it mm -hmm. and then he put all of his actions i know it's a movie it's all based upon a graphic novel but it was such a great example of the dynamics of those two working well together mm. and i noticed that when you and i are in parody we slay dragons yes but we're individual it takes such a long time to move forward totally i'm takes not a saying mad at each other just moving forward right so the dynamic is this. I want us on this call today to talk about what it takes for us guys to enable women to become better leaders so we can grow better businesses, communities, and countries together. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the call today. And, and who's that? Wait, who just said that? Richard. Oh, Mr. Richard. Who looks awesome in photos. Wait till you see his photo. Looks Hansen incredible. Burke. What's going on? What do you think, Richard? Yeah, you had a guest one time that talked about all he likes to do is hire women in his business because they tend to not realize how much they are um, worth. And what happens is, is that they go out and, uh, you know, they do as good a job as men and then they don't get paid as much because of that. And that kind of speaks to this in a different way as well, because when you're in a startup situation, the scrappiness that uh, it requires to just ask for things that you're, you're basically making up um, uh, is, uh, is more typical of, uh, of a man's role in some of these cases. Not that a woman can't do it, but just not typically. And, uh, uh, you know, when you've got something running, uh, the people strengths of women uh, come into greater play. I think women need to be enabled. Let's, let's bring on our special guest today. It's one of your favorite people in the whole world. <gasps> Allison! <laughs> Am I the special guest? I was like, who's the special guest? You know, you know, I wanted the two dynamic women to be hanging out here, okay? <laughs> um, our, our show that we do once a week is the second most watched show on metal after our billionaire show, the guy who's a billionaire who does our show. So the, over the course of a week, almost all the metal guys are going to watch this, okay? 
So my goal today, Allison, was I started looking at the COVID cases in countries around the world. And I realized that the countries that had the least amount of spreadable cases and the lowest number of deaths were all countries that were run by women. Mm -hmm. uh, well, <laughs> I mean, it only makes sense. <laughs> right? It kind of blew my mind. I'm starting to look at this going, oh my God, Finland, New Zealand, uh, uh, Germany. You saw this whole design work where the women are looking at this very differently than the men are. So then I started looking at the Forbes 500 list. And there's only 37 women CEOs, 37. And I'm realizing that in all the businesses that I've started, men are great at the grunt work. <laughs> but the minute they bring in a woman CEO later on, those businesses flourish. So it's like a Gwen Shotwell from SpaceX. Gwen runs SpaceX for Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. She runs it. SpaceX is killing it. I mean, it's beating NASA. It makes sense. It may, but she has to manage this incredibly dynamic organization being SpaceX. And it's purring. It's doing incredibly well. Wow. So I wanted to talk about Allison. I wanted to get these two dynamic women on. <laughs> and I wanted to talk to you ladies about what does it take for us men to move aside, to enable, and to give the resources and tools to allow women to build these incredible businesses and countries and governments, because we see it's proof in the pudding right now around yeah. COVID. And even if you look at, um, I, don't, I don't have these numbers in front of me, I would have, if I would known that this was the topic, but the percentage of venture capital funds that go to women-owned startups is so, so, so I small. I percent Yeah, it's so small. By the um, way, so you guys know, this is Allison. Allison is, would you say one of the most amazing women you've ever met in your life? A badass. A badass, right? Allison has climbed Mount Everest one, almost two times. She has climbed the tallest peak in each continent of the world, and she has skied both the North and South Pole. And that's before she even gets up for, for breakfast. <laughs> she is one of the top speakers in the world. She speaks sometimes three to four times a week, and she's considered one of the top speakers literally in the world. Mm -hmm. So, and she's somebody who I admire greatly, and I know you two have been hanging out. Yes. And I'm going to see her next week. Yes, next week. So, oh, there's another reason why you need to go up there. So, Allison, of all the conferences you go and speak at, yeah, how many of them are run by women? Hardly any. Well, so the there's the women are the meeting planners, yeah. but they're not the main person. You know, the the meeting planner that's doing the logistics, right? They're not the person actually throwing the event or running the event. You know, it's, I would say 3%. Well, there you go. It goes almost right back to Forbes list of the 500 companies, 37 women, which is about yeah. 46%. So I want to start with this first topic. And that's something that Richard Burke just brought up. You hire women and you notice that women are cheaper. And it's because they do not negotiate well. No, it's not that I notice they're cheaper. It's that I could get them at a lower rate because they don't negotiate. And you do it. Sometimes, yeah. But it, I look at it as, okay, my business, what do I need to get through this ground phase of this part of my business? Can I, should I pay someone $97 an hour to do this job? Or will I get the same result if I pay someone $12 an hour? Right. Yeah. That's kind of a big jump, but it's like, I'm going to logistically do what works best for my business at that time. It doesn't matter if it's a woman or a man. If I find a guy who's going to do the same thing as good as a woman, but he's cheaper, I'm probably going to go that route. But it also depends on what it is. So if I'm looking for something that's very specific, very strategic. I think gonna... women are pricing themselves lower to begin with just because they feel like maybe yeah. are they undervaluing themselves or they feel like I have to undercut the price in order to potentially get the business because I'm a woman and I might not be considered otherwise. I think on, it's, it's that, it's those two elements, but it's also, I have to prove myself. So yeah. if I go in and ask for, you know, $10,000 for this job and they say, no, I can't prove myself. Well, if I undercut myself and ask $5,000 for the job, 
prove myself, I can always ask for it more later. That's mm -hmm. a lot of the thinking that I've seen women go in as. I've done it myself. I'm so guilty of that. Yeah. But, but we're not uh, hindering anything. It's, they're not negotiating. Properly. Are we doing it to ourselves? Yes, yeah. you're plus sabotage. Yeah. So there's a- 100%. Yeah. She sees me do this all the time. We go into a restaurant, Alison, I'm not sure if I've told you this before. And when the check comes and there's an area for a tip, I always ask the waiter or waitress, wait staff, I go, how much should I put here? I literally give them the right to decide their own tip. Okay? Really? So a woman will go, 15%. Yeah. Okay, and I'll put in, let's say it's $100. I'll put $15 in. There you go. I ask a guy, a guy will go, 50 bucks. And I'll put $50 in. Yeah. $50, here you go. Well, I like, well, 15% if, if everything was okay, but it's okay if you want to do that. Exactly. So, justify. Women will justify. Like we apologize. We yeah. apologize. But guys just go, hey, whatever I can get, I'm going to milk you for it. <laughs> Right? And I'm wondering, mm -hmm. how do we raise women to be a little more assertive when it comes to this? It starts early Great on. It, it's, this goes back to the example of little boys and little girls. So if you watch little boys, they're misbehaving so badly. They're running amok, they're yelling, they're hitting their friends, they're doing things. Parents will stop them and kind of like, hey, don't behave like that. You have to do this or don't do that. Or I'm going to get you if you do, right? They'll chide them a little bit. But ultimately, they kind of have some free reign to be little boys. If a little girl, same age, does the exact same thing, it's stop that. That's not how ladies act. Stop right. misbehaving. You're not acting like a girl. Yeah, and women, little girls are praised for being well behaved, exactly. and little boys are praised for like being adventurous. Exactly. So that starts breaking into the psyche of women that they have to be polite mm. and perfect and act a certain way and ask permission and do all of the perfect things that perfect little ladies do, which isn't going, give me 50 bucks. That's not polite. All we need to do, though, is ask Allison what changed her to go out and go climb Mount Everest and uh, do these other amazing feats that oftentimes, certainly most men don't do, let alone women. Right. But if I may say something, I think children raised with a man, with the father in the house, they become more confident. Because I have three granddaughters. My eldest granddaughter, she, she's very confident. I'm not confident. I know my, I know I'm getting more confident now, but my eldest granddaughter, she doesn't care if kids don't want to play with her. She's fine. The other two, if other girls don't want to play with them, they get really secure. They, they get really insecure. They, they back down, but my oldest one, fine. You don't want to be with me? Fine. And she'll walk away. That's because they're extremely close. Yeah. The other ones are still growing, but I think a father makes a huge difference in a child's life. Okay. female or male okay, so it's that. not just a father because you can still put a father in that same situation and if he's a jerk to a his good father yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah. it but, a but, but go look at a, a strong father yes that allison and sandy you guys should meet is esther wazitsky do you know esther do you know esther allison have you met her so esther um she teaches a school in mountain view california it's one of the hardest yeah. schools to get into uh everybody gets an a in her class now you're thinking oh that sucks no, when you turn a paper in, if it's not A quality, you're given the paper back. You have to produce A quality stuff all the time. So her students that graduate are insane. They're the best wow. of them. Wow. She's a single mom. Her three daughters, one runs Cedars Sinai. The other one runs and created 23andMe and her other daughter runs YouTube. So they're yeah. badass. Yeah. A strong woman yeah. to raise it. So it's not just about dad, it's about a strong woman too. You and I had kids, we had great kids. You had kids, we if had kids. We what? had kids, like, we would have great from? kids. <laughs> but is that a proposal? But Al <laughs> I'm not gonna do it here on Zoom. <laughs> Allison, <laughs> the only woman that's ever spoken at metal, ever, where oh. the guys go, make her a member. <laughs> So guys do not feel intimidated by you. They actually feel like you're part of the gang. Yeah. What is that about? Why are you like that? And what do you do deliberately to have that connection? Ah, oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, so first of all, I think part of it is that uh, my sport, like my passion is kind of a testosterone 
fulfilled sport. You know, I don't know if I was a, like an ice dancer or something, would they feel the same? I don't know. I don't know. Um, so it's a sport that men can relate to, to begin with. An ice dancer. Um, you know, well, that's what like an Olympic sport, right? Ice dancing, not, which is different than figure skating. It's different. It's ice dancing. I was just trying to think of something that was like more, I don't know, or like synchronized swimming or something. Um, so I don't know if it's because the sport is a male dominated sport, but I think also, um, but being a CEO yeah. is male dominated, obviously in the fortune yeah. by Harmony. It's a male dominated sport yeah. right now. So you somehow found a way to make men not feel intimidated. Well, I think also having a sense of humor because there's a lot of humor in my talk and having a sense of humor, I think makes people in general more relatable. Yeah, I think that's a good point. That's really interesting. And you I mean, are funny. <laughs> I know I'm not funny just like this, but I am in my speech. Like I'm not funny every day, but in my you work as a consultant, you've done stuff with, uh, was it McKinsey with, who are you with? Um, no, I, well, I worked for Goldman Sachs right out of business school for a couple of years. So I worked in financial services just for a couple of years. It was very junior. And then, um, but I, yeah, I worked, um, I worked on the Schwarzenegger campaign and a lot of guys, you know, guys can relate to Arnold and, um, I was his deputy finance director. And then I taught at West Point. I was in the Department of Behavioral Sciences and Leadership uh, on the part-time faculty there. And, and I currently work with um, West Point's executive education program, which is the Thayer Leader Program. I'm actually the only non-military um, instructor on the faculty. Our goal today is to figure out what it takes to enable men to enable women. Okay, so I think that- I'm mostly on this faculty with a bunch of generals. Like, some of them are four-star, retired four-star. Well, how do they let you have so much space? How I don't know. <laughs> I, um, I, well, no, you know what it is, is because my stories and the way I teach and the lessons that I teach are very applicable to extreme environments, right? So leadership in extreme environments is different from leadership in everyday environments. Let, let's um, get you guys too. So- let me go to, I'm looking at Michael. Michael, what do you think it takes for us? Because I think guys are in the way. Uh, I think uh, we need to open up our minds saying, you know what? Yeah, go for it. I, I'd have you run my companies like that. And Harvey, even if I didn't know you the way I know you, you would be a great leader. Do you have- I would have run mine too, so. Yeah, <laughs> pretty damn good. <laughs> Michael, so do you work with many women executives? Um, yeah, definitely. Well, I, I, Pretty much all of my managers at Disney are are women. Um, you know, I think I think men um, have to give up. Men have to be okay or give up the notion of being dominated. I think there's a fear of that, and there's a fear of if you let a woman lead, then that means that you're weak. Oh. That, that there's there's this like underlying fear I I, I sense, and I, I could be wrong, um, but it it seems like it, that's in the male culture because we just want to be in control and we because we want to know how it is and we want to you know so everything to be perfect because of feeling dominated dominated or weak somehow is set in their back of their minds and that's why they create barriers and they don't promote women maybe it's possible yeah there's some sort of not good enough belief in the background i think being something that's been built into the way that male thinking is because they're the leaders, the ones who take charge. They're very masculine. They have to be on top. They can't let a woman step up. But I think that is something that is almost like an old stereotype that just needs to be reprogrammed and over and overwritten. Let me go to yeah. Teddy. Teddy, you're one of the younger guys here. What's your thought on this? Uh, it's interesting. I've been in a relationship for a year and a half. Um, well, and I've been, have had women employees and and the old me was very critical of them and and would use that as a way to make them better and i think i've been learning how to be unconditionally supportive i think people some people work better when they're criticized other people work better when they're supportive and for me enablement is is it's just what the word is it's like how can i give my resources to the women to let them be free to create whatever they want the way they want it um, and not really try to, to control how, them how too much. You, how do you feel in the past you were 
Are you saying that? Well, you, well, gonna, here's the okay. phenomenon that happened because I have a, I have a strong girlfriend, and and I would tell her what to do, and she would say, "Just because you told me, I don't want to do it because it's not my idea." <laughs> and and so and so and eventually she kind of learned that a lot of the time I was right. So it was a give and take where she where she was like, "Okay, let me." consider this let me do it uh, but now i don't really tell her what to do anymore i just support whatever she's doing which which is making her grow fast and she's got her own vision and it's beautiful um but i'm very careful it's like it's like if you're going to give anyone criticism you know instead of saying you should like avoid the should word and instead ask them questions so that it's their idea and their answer in the first place so that for me that's i've been like learning how to do that um and it's been it's been a lot of growth and that's true i mean women hate being told especially by a man that they should do something they just we just don't like it and and, and it has a lot of it's a preconceived idea of what what michael was talking about where you know some men feel intimidated by the women so they have to assert their power and their strength well women don't like to be belittled or brought down by men so when a man is telling you, telling a woman you need to do this and that, they're like, oh, oh, oh. And, and some of that could stem from, you know, their family. If the dad was very controlling and told them what to do all the time and they felt like they had no opportunity to grow and explore themselves. So you're doing it right, Teddy. By you do have, a, you, you do have a younger girl too, okay? You are dating somebody that is younger than you, um, dramatically younger than you. And uh, how I- How old is he? Okay. Teddy, no, how well, old are you? 35. Oh, you look so much younger. <laughs> okay, that could be the and She's 20, right? <laughs> she's 23, but why does it matter? Because I think around those ages, there, women grow immense. Everyone grows a lot during that time, and they oh, yeah. learn to communicate differently. Oh, yeah. She's the, the year and a half we spent together, both of us, but very much her as well is a completely different person. Yeah, I, I think, yeah. I'm, I'm curious, Allison, if you have all these guys that are around you that are very powerful and they want to have you work on a project or do something, how do they, because it sounds like they see you as a peer. Yeah. Do they ever break ranks and say, you should do this, or this is an order or something ridiculous like that? Do they ever be chauvinistic in some ways? Um. I don't, so first of all, I don't get that at all with my work at the Thayer, Thayer Leader Program because the people there are just entrenched in the West Point values, you know, duty on our country. They're just respectful people. And so I don't get that from them at all, at all. Yeah, because you're um, in a very healthy environment. Yeah, it, it is a super healthy environment. Plus the woman, the program is run by a woman who came out of GE you know, and um, like GE with all their, you know, leadership stuff back in the day, Jack Welch, Jim, you know, Jeff Immel, you know, they were like the leadership factory back in the day. You know, a lot of that's been disputed, you know, but uh, I think, you know, because she came from there and, and they respected her for that. So I think, um, but also just having, I think my background helps, you know, having been in these extreme environments, I think that that gives me some street cred versus maybe if I was just a random like professor that got hired. I noticed when Sandy works with people, regardless they're guys or girls, she treats them exactly the same. Yeah. She's just as, uh, I don't want to use the word. Do this, do that. Yes, I didn't say bossy, <laughs> but, <laughs> but she treats them the same. Yeah. Well, only in my industry, because I know what I'm doing, I know I'm right. So. <laughs> I noticed. <laughs> I treat men differently than women. And yeah. um, the woman that works for me, I say with me, by the way, Jennifer, she broke me of that saying. And she starts to talk to me like a dude, you know, where she goes, all right, motherfucker, let's do this. Like, and all of a sudden I realized she's saying, put it on me. Come on, come on. I can take it. Yeah. I can take it. And in other words, she's saying, don't sugarcoat it. Tell me. Not at all. <laughs> and she really elevated me to elevate the way I treat her to where there's no sugarcoating. And, Interesting. But it took her to reprogram me. Mm -hmm. It took her to make me go, all right, I see you just like everybody else. And that was right. tough. Alan, I see that you have your hand up. Alan, what's your, you have a question, comment or something? Go for it, Alan. 
Well, this is primarily for chain of command relationships, I gather, as opposed to a spouse. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's uh, not talk about that. That's a different world. Well, it's still, it's the, uh, you know, she might say, get to the point. I mean, she has, a, a, you know, phenomenal leadership. And Who's that, Jennifer? Decision making wife, skills. Who, who are you speaking wife. to? Ellen, who are you? No, I, was, I was referring to my wife. Oh, got it. Okay. And so it, it's not a chain of command relationships that I used to have, perhaps, with many different women. Uh, it's a different kettle of fish, I guess, really. And I respect and enjoy and appreciate that leadership capability that she has and that we share. It's, it's interesting that we know that the women we're with, we know that they can handle any, anything. I, I tell Sandy, she's got my back. Matter of fact, if something happened to me and I'm in a coma and I wake up a year from now, everything's going to be fine. Actually, it'd probably be better. <laughs> and I know that. And, it, and that's what uh, yeah. attracts me to you. Allison, you're probably the same way. I feel that way about Pat as well. He's but got I my back no matter what. About you. I, don't, I don't have a, honestly, like, the world could be caving in and I'd be like, I'm with Pat, I'm gonna be fine. Aww. But I'm talking about taking charge too. You will take charge if something happened to him. Yeah, I would never let anything happen to him. Yeah, yeah. same way. And I, I think if I look at somebody like a Sheryl Sandberg over at Facebook, Facebook is her child. Yeah. And she will do everything and everything to make sure it's going to survive. And this goes back to like Game of Thrones. All the dominant women in Game of Thrones would do anything to keep their domain alive. Yeah. Right? The guys weren't like that. They kept their surroundings alive. Yeah. You know, Jon Snow's only keeping Jon Snow's group alive where, you know, his, his evil sister would just destroy everything to keep it alive because it's her domain. Very, very different. Okay, so here's our exercise, guys. Everyone in this group, I want us all to think of three ways that we can enable or empower women to take more charge of what they want, not of what we want them to do, <laughs> of what they want to do. How do we enable them? So for example, uh, I, uh, my last show, Business Rockstars, what I did is I made sure of the 20 guests I would have on a week, 20, by the way, 60% um, of them were women. So I, I carved out a space to give women a place to have a conversation what they're doing, give them earned media to talk to the masses. Number two, I made sure, and I still to this day, if any of my women friends need access to anybody, I don't in my mind go, oh, you want to date him? Or I never ever even suggest that in my mind. I know it's for a business or something to elevate their career. I open up my Rolodex right away. Open up my Rolodex. And number three, I made sure to always mentor women when they ask to be mentored. My biggest problem was I, many of my guys say, oh, they're trying to date you or they're trying to break you up or whatever. And I know that's not the case. I really believe that. I mean, I, I, I'm, fairly good at knowing when someone's going after me the wrong way, but I make sure I mentor. Now, mentoring means I open up my Rolodex, I give them credit where credit is due, I make sure I find ways to help them get paid for what they are. So by doing those three things, visibility, access, and mentoring, I believe that's what I'm doing to foster and help women out. I want you- Visibility all is key and also, you know, when there are conferences, put women on stage, put them you know, give them airtime at these conferences and events, put them on the main stage. Don't just have them be the breakout speaker, you know. Yeah, but why are there so few great women speakers that we see? Because there are so many great women speakers, but we yeah. don't see great women speakers on stage. You know, it's the Jack Canfields, it's the staples yeah. that are out there. And it, it kind of frustrates me. Heck, you and I are in a group called Podium and you're the only woman in the whole group. <laughs> Um, well, I, I will say there, there probably are, there, there definitely are some good female speakers out there, but one problem is, is that, uh, a lot of them are good speakers, but they don't have the right materials to market themselves. You have to have good video. You have to have good video of you on stage speaking to a big group. You can't, it can't be a shitty video from some little dinner meeting, you know, where there's waiters walking across the frame and plates 
clanking and it's just like you're or you're in a conference room or something like it's got to be on a stage with good lighting and good cameras like you've got to represent yourself as a professional so a lot of women don't have the video but um yeah and and they assume that they're not getting booked because they're a woman instead of realizing that they're not getting booked because they don't have good speaking footage. They don't have professional footage. That totally makes sense. So, and so they just assume, oh, I'm a woman. That's why I'm not getting the gigs. I'm like, no, p people are falling all over themselves trying to book female keynote speakers. But unless you have good video, you're not going to get booked. Um, and the other thing is you have to have a topic that is, is, appealing and interesting and going to be informative to a large, a wide array of audiences. Like if your topic is, I don't know, like how to be a good aunt, you know, <laughs> like you're not, you're not. And cause I know someone and that's her topic. Like I didn't want kids, but I've learned how to be a really good aunt. And that's her speaking topic. Nobody's going to pay her money. Like you have to have something that people pay money for and the majority of corporate American audiences are male dominated. They don't want to hear how to be a good aunt. They don't even want to hear how to be a good uncle. Like it's just not what they're going to pay for. So you have to give them something that's going to help them be better when they walk out of the room. How are you going to improve their life? How are you going to help them be better at something more efficient, faster, more creative, something you've got to give them something. And a lot of female speakers don't realize that. And they just think, they have the right topic and they're just not getting booked because they're a woman and that just doesn't serve them well. Thomas, why don't you come on in? I just unmuted you. So share what you just put inside the chat, Thomas. Yeah, so I, I've um, been mentoring students for about 10 years now at Dominguez Hills and something I learned in Silicon Valley where everybody who's a manager gets a coach is to encourage them to get the highest level mentor they can. A lot of women you know, feel they need a female mentor and I say that's great, have a female mentor. There's things that in that lived experience I don't have, but you're really losing out if you don't get the highest quality mentor available, right? If the CEO, CFO, white male wants to talk to you and will give you that time and open up the Rolodex, yeah. go for it, right? And, and, you know, but I do find I do a lot more nudging when I observe students and organizations. You know, I push some of my students saying, you're my student, run for president. No hands are up right now. First hand might get it, right? And, and so I think those are a few of the things, you know, can do to try to push uh, you know, female students to, to grab for that ring and, and kind of learn what it takes to operate in this world. Where is California State University? Where is that? Uh, that's, I'm glad you asked, Ken. Uh, Carson, if you've ever gone to what used to be StubHub, now Dignity, to see the galaxy, we're, we're like the most unknown university in Los Angeles. So maybe oh. between Long Beach and LA. Wow. <laughs> Carson. Okay, and that's a state school? Yeah, we're, we're, we've grown it since I joined. We're 9,000, we're now 17,000 uh, yeah, state uh, students. So 7,000 a year tuition, a little cheaper than USC. That's crazy, Never, now we know. Thanks. And that's my new building behind me. It's a beautiful building. When you say it's your building, how what, are you part of the faculty, obviously? What do you do? Yeah, I'm part of the faculty, so trying to, to bring some exposure. So I uh, left Silicon Valley 2001. I was looking for something new to do and thought I would try teaching. I got a job here, and you know, I, I haven't left. We're, we graduate with the largest number of African-American students in the state of California, uh, you know, 70% first-generation students. So basically trying to get you new members. You know, I'm, I'm really glad I found metal because I'm from Minnesota originally. I didn't know about all this entertainment stuff. Um, and, and so hopefully, you know, 10 years, we'll have a great pipeline for some great members. Well, then, Thomas, what can your school do to enable women to be better leaders? What can you do? And I'm not saying set quotas and do things like that, but to make women feel like I can talk to a Scott Painter who has true car and or cars direct and fair.com, or I can see an Elon Musk and feel comfortable. How do you enable women to feel like they have the ability? You know, today I just had one of my students from eight years ago speak to my class and show her success. Uh, Justina Epps, a student of mine at SpaceX. So, you know, the story you're telling, she's told me the same stories about who really runs SpaceX. Uh, so you, uh, you know, I try to bring the local success because I can say, well, you went to Harvard or, you know, you're, you're this old, you know, gray haired guy, you know, I'm not gonna believe you, but they will believe somebody who was in that same seat six, seven years ago, um, as well as, uh, you know, a colleague of mine, Mike Grimshaw, I know has had a few of your um, you know, metal buddies on campus in our classroom. Uh, we created an innovation incubator where um, our second class, 
the first six um, CEOs were all females. And boy, was that interesting, you know, being a fly on the wall, listening to six female executives talk about things like before a Zoom call, you know, I put on my lipstick or even a phone call. I'm like, really? Like, you know, I'm sure, you know, your better half would know. Yeah, you put, you know, you get dressed up and you look really nice. Even from the phone. I did that. Is that wrong? What's wrong with that? I just did that. Oh, oh, bomb. (laughs) Hey, by the way, you should have Sandy speak. I'm just going to say, you know, confidence. She's one of the world leaders on that. So you're going to do that. I want to go to uh, Paul, if you wake up, that'd be great if you can actually be in front of your computer. Paul, Paul, I guess not. We got a great view of Paul's office. Uh, Hmm. I want you all to figure out what you can do to enable women. Alice, you're, you're an amazing woman. What can you do to enhance women? to give them a better leadership, uh, positive moving forward, uh, I mean, direction moving forward. What can you do? You too, by the way, come up with something. Well, I'll tell you one other thing I've tried to do is when, um, so I'll tell you that 95% of the talks I do are for male dominated audiences and maybe 5% are for women's events. And when I do the pre-call with the client and I talk to them and they say, uh, I'm like, who's, who's coming? They're like, all the women, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, how many men are coming? And they say, we didn't invite men. I'm like, that is a big mistake because you have this women's network that's working, you know, to elevate the presence of women, women's visibility, promotability, all these things. And you all know what you need to do, but you're not including men in this conversation. And as long as you keep men out of the conversation, you're not going to have advocates and allies within the company. And so I always tell them, start inviting men to these events because we're holding these meetings and we're talking about what we need to do to help women. But we already know it's, we need the men to be our allies. And if you keep them out of these meetings and events, then they don't know how to help us. So it's bringing men into the conversation is really important. Do you find that women lack confidence? Um, some, and then I feel like some are overly confident. Yeah. How about you? Yeah, I can see that too. You mean some, but what's a some number? Are you saying 40%? I mean, I'm just giving you an idea. If you're in a room of 10 women are. Oh, well, okay. Uh, let me take that back. I do feel like women lack confidence and I feel like the ones that drive me crazy, like on Facebook that are constantly bragging and touting all of their achievements, maybe deep down don't have confidence and they're doing that so they can feel more important and feel more relevant. Yep. What about you? Oh, okay. oh, for sure. I see it all the time, especially the ones who are, some of the women who seem the most confident, I've often found that that's just a front that they're putting out there because they're yeah. so insecure. So those are the women that when you actually tackle them with the big issue, they break down. Mm. So yeah. it's there. It's there. So what are you going to do to enhance and help women have more of a positive forward movement to run businesses and become better CEOs and all that? Aside from what I'm already doing? Yeah. Well, what are you doing? So I put together Confidence Jam, which is a program to help. I target women, but it's for everybody. But it's to help women in particular overcome all of those self-worth issues that's causing them to behave like they might be overly confident as a front instead of being authentically confident or maybe they're not speaking up or being confident at all they're not making the choices or doing the things that they need to do to improve their lives and be better for other people one of the big things that you'll see women do a lot is the yes they'll say yes to everything a friend or family member or colleague asks them to do something and they say yes because they want to be liked they don't want to be they don't want to disappoint someone else and they don't have the confidence to say no And they won't put themselves first. So they just openly say yes to everything. And it's a detriment. I see it destroy women's lives. It's destroyed my life. I see men do the same thing. How how do you make sure you're not saying yes all the time? You have to evaluate the situation. So if there's something that you know is going to cause hardship to you. So it could be emotional stress, financial stress. It could be physical stress, any kind of hardship to you. And you're going to say yes to it. You're doing yourself a disservice and the person you're saying yes to. So you have to reflect on, okay, if I say yes to this, what's the outcome? Mm. And if the outcome isn't a positive one for both you and the other person, then you have to say no. And people will say yes for so many reasons, but when you say yes to something that you don't feel good about, or you know it's gonna spread you too thin, you're going to be burned out. You're not going to be as effective at the thing that you're, you're saying yes to. You won't be able to produce the same result as if you were in a good place and saying yes to that. And also a big thing is you're taking away the opportunity for the person who you would say yes to, to find another solution and grow from there. There's a woman I met a while ago. I, I really admire her name is Dolly Singh. I, have, I try to connect with Dolly. She's super busy. She created a company called Thesis Couture and she worked for SpaceX 
and she worked for Oculus and she walked about 10 miles a day in her heels. So she figured out how to make heels basically mold to your feet so they would feel like almost like tennis shoes. Now they're in cheap, they were $2,400 $2, starting, but she ended up getting scientists and engineers and, and, and astronauts all involved in her company because she figured out, hey, if we can make rocket ships that use AI to go to all these great, cool locations, why can't we make shoes that feel comfortable heels? And what I remember about her is she was tough around men and women but she was uh, putting on women because she wanted them to be more dominant because yeah, they should have been. To elevate them to that and, and, and women wanted to be around her because of that. Mm -hmm. And she's brought some amazing women together, but she learned all that from like Elon Musk mm -hmm. on how to be like that because of SpaceX. And I'm wondering, do you think that's it? Do you think women need to be tougher on women? Women need stronger role models, mm -hmm. but you have to be careful how tough you're being on what type of woman. Because you're not a queen bee syndrome type thing. It, yeah, it's not a queen bee, queen bee, but it's also understanding the situation that the woman might be in. Sometimes due to past trauma, she might not be able to handle that toughness. Oh, good point. So it's about being aware. I always say awareness is the most important thing. Be aware if you're timid or you're shy or you have things that are triggering you to behave a certain way. And once you own that awareness, then you can make the choice to do something about I it. it. I love it. Uh, Michael, I know you just put something in the chat. Why don't you just unmute yourself and bring it up and then Teddy, you're next. Put your cool hand down. Michael, <laughs> go for it. Oh yeah, well, I have just a couple ideas when you were if you're thinking about three ways that you know, you know that, that could help women in that in that in that environment. Because um, we were talking about creators, so I think women are natural creators, um, and so and part of that is their emotional intelligence and and intuition. I feel like is 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 they can easily access. So. Um, if you get like trust intuition, don't try to figure it out. Um, that's where the ego goes, you know, and, and men and women both do this. Um, so that was my first point. And the second one, um, I think a lot of women feel like they have to be very masculine. They have to take on very masculine qualities. Um, I know my mother worked in the, in the corporate world for, for years um, and couldn't wait to just come home and just, ugh, you know, just let it all out, you know, and, and, so I think sometimes women lose themselves when they become too masculine. Um, so it, maybe there's a way to find a balance uh, and, and know how to like turn on that switch. And, and like, this is when I need to be masculine and, and compete. And then also have that balance of uh, a feminine, feminine creative energy and um, nurturing energy as well. Um, and then my third point was, um, you know, in, integrity, um, integrity, integrity and confidence in, in your ability. Like when you go into the lion's den, <laughs> whether you're a man or a woman, you got to be confident. You got to be confident at what you can provide and what you can offer um, and, and be as clean as possible, you know, because it's because men are naturally competitive and they will look, they will find any kind of vulnerability, you know, any kind of way. If they're intimidated by you, they'll try to bringing it down a peg, you know, it's, it's, it's got to be ready for that. So yeah, yeah, that's true. The countries I want to mention, and you can even say what, what, what countries had the best response to COVID, it's Germany, Taiwan, New Zealand, Iceland, Finland, Norway, and Denmark, all run by women. Um, and I would say other than Angela Merkel, they're all fairly feminine women. I mean, they come across like that. They're very nurturing. Teddy, you wanted to say something real quick? Yeah, I have a a friend who's suffering from queen bee syndrome. She's very self-entitled and, and it, she gets I to know the her. point. <laughs> <laughs> she, she gets to the point where it's, I feel like whenever I'm around her, I'm talking to a scorpion. And, and if I say anything constructive or try to give her feedback or, or even tell her, hey, I wish I could give you feedback, she'll just get defensive and sting and sting and sting. and. And, and it's, and it's kind of sad cause she's, she used to be one of my best friends and, and I'm really struggling with how to, I want her to be open. She's so closed off and she's so self-righteous. She's older than all of us in the community. So she thinks she's right. She thinks everyone that's young will never be right just cause they're young. Um, and we have, we have somebody like that too. She lacks awareness of yes. herself. Yes. We have a lot of people and like that. And I'm like, and I don't know whether I should just bless her and dismiss her and stop being her friend because I really want to help her just 
love herself and listen to other people, but she's terrified and she's so blocked and she'll just control the conversation and be defensive. What do you, what do, you do on that, Allison? Um, God. It's interesting because sometimes you have to let people find their own way a bit. Um, Cause I have someone, I, when you were talking, I was thinking of this woman who um, we, kind of started out as friends, but then she became so self-absorbed and entitled, like her Facebook posts, I felt were so elitist and self-entitled and condescending and constantly bragging. And then she asked me, like she started a TV, like she's like, I'm starting my own like YouTube TV channel and I'm gonna interview interesting you know, people. Will you be one of my first guests? And I actually declined because I don't wanna be associated with her brand. Because when I look at her and the, when I look at the things that she posts on social media and whatever you post on social media becomes part of your brand. I don't care if it's your personal page, but it's, Oh, it's not my, my business page. It's my personal page. It doesn't matter. Whatever you post becomes part of your brand. And someone might look at that one post when they are trying to find you on Facebook and that one hit that, that one point of reference is their entire impression of you. Right. So if you are condescending and, you know, demeaning to people and, you know, it's come off as entitled, that's what they think of you. And I know she's not necessarily, I know she's a good person with a good heart, but her posts I feel are so toxic that I didn't want to have anything to do with her brand. And so I've been toying with, you know, how do I tell her this, you know, about her brand? But then I just thought, you know what, she is a highly, highly intelligent you know, 46 year old woman. And I feel like I kind of need to just let her find her way and make her own mistakes. And um, it's not necessarily my place to like step in and try to show her because maybe she looks at me and thinks my my way is the wrong way. Or maybe she thinks my posts are offensive or something. I don't know. So um, you're just gonna let her be that. I think I am. This is something that's very sensitive and, and clearly she, along with Teddy's friend, need to do more work on themselves. But I am a firm believer and I've had this experience with other women um, where they're the queen bee and they're a know-it-all and they are, you know, exactly what Allison was describing and Teddy, that's the same person. So we all know that person. And ultimately I had to make the choice to do two things. Step away from the relationship just to save myself and put my best mm. interests first and let them know. That one's the scariest thing to do because uh, just as Allison said, maybe she thinks differently of me, but when you don't let them know, you yeah. are actually doing them a disservice because yeah, if that's you're true. In a place of integrity and you're working from your heart and being an example of what you think is the best, you have to let them know. And you can do it in a kind way, but you have to let them know why you're choosing not to be with them and what it is that you see that probably needs some work. So you don't need to go, you're this way and you're an asshole and you need to go seek therapy. But yeah. you can say something more simplified as in, um, when you do these things, it comes across as aggressive and it makes me feel uncomfortable. So now you're letting them know how you feel without pinpointing exactly what it is. Yeah. You can be a little bit more vague in that. And then you have to step away. And just the yeah. action of stepping away, they might not take it in that moment. They might go, ew, you're a jerk, you're a bitch, whatever it is, we hate you. And then they'll continue on their rant but when they start seeing other people doing the same thing, that's when they'll have that reset and they'll have to assess their lives and then make that choice to change. It's powerful. So I've done it to women in the past and it hurt. I, I, when I was younger, I had to break up with someone and I cried for months. I was really hurt and I had to step away and I let her know what it was. Three years later, that person came back and apologized. And that person, wow. that person. but it took three years. Yeah. Well, I, to me, I think part of the frustration was that she's talked to me in the past about people that have said things to her along those lines. And she just chalks it up to they're envious of her professional success. But if so, she respects you in any way, shape or form, and now you're giving her back what she's mentioned to you, there will be a point in her life where she'll go, oh boy. Yeah. It might not happen right away, but I think you're right that down the road, that's when the light bulb often goes on and people are like, aha. I had a moment like that actually just last week where a light bulb, like someone that said something to me seven years ago that I completely disagreed with. I was like, oh my God, she was so right on. And it exactly. just like, it literally just happened last week. I've had the same thing. And you know what's interesting about this whole conversation is it goes both ways for good and bad. 
Yeah. And this is what I, when I ta teach confidence, I tell people, when someone says something nice about you, you're, you have a lovely personality. You're so funny. You have such a beautiful spirit and you go, oh, no, I don't. Or you just right. negate that or minimize what they've said to you. You're doing the same thing. And then right. years in the future will go, wow, all those things people said to me over the years that I didn't believe. It's true. And it shifts your whole being. So we have to listen to the, the feedback from others, whether it's good or bad. If someone says to me, like I had a friend who used to say, you know, Sandy, you come on too strong. And I was like, oh, no, I don't. No, I don't. And I come on super, super strong to prove that I don't. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> years, years of work, I finally realized that person was right. I can come on very strong. So instead of beating myself up over it, like I'm such a jerk, I can come on so strong and hiding from that or changing who I am, I actually chose to accept it, but put it in the right place. So I'll come on very strong when I'm talking about my industry or what I have to do in my business to get my client to work properly. That's where I hold my ground and I say it's this way or the highway. And I have to hold that. And I, I love that about myself. But then I know not to do that at other times and I, I'm aware of it. So I choose not to be strong in other situations. So that is where we're at. Allison, how's the book going? It came out like 400 years ago, but how's it going? Oh, good. <laughs> it's going well. Actually, I think virtual is helping me because um, now when I come to a virtual talk, sometimes like because I don't get to meet the people in person, they'll, they'll buy, they'll be like, and you're all getting a copy of Allison's book. I'm like, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, um, so that's all good. That's and the book is? Oh, the book's called On the Edge, uh, Leadership Lessons from Mount Everest and Other Extreme Environments. You got one right there? Of course you do. Hang on, I got one right here. Oh, I just stepped on my dog. <laughs> Which, there it is, On the Edge, and that's you. That's you right there. That's actually a photo, that's a photo of me right there. How crazy that's that is. That's awesome. Damn. How, how far up are you on that one? Like 20,000 feet. Oh, okay. On yeah, in Alaska, and it's in, yeah, in an Alaska mountain. That's range. awesome. And people want to do your confidence class? Yes, go what to sandyandfocus.com and you'll find confidence jam. You got to take the quiz. You got to take the quiz. It is okay. awesome. I'm being serious because it's not a normal quiz where it's just like questions. There's images and graphics. It's like what song describes you right now? Ooh, you want to know, right? And you know, even if you don't think confidence is for you, like I feel confident, I don't need it. Maybe there's someone in your life that does. So yeah. check it out. Yeah. Allison, thank you very much for just popping in and hanging My out. My pleasure. Anytime. My Good pleasure, you guys. Great yes, to see everybody. Week. Nice talking to you. We're going to hang out next week. Bye, everyone. See you Thanks all later. You guys. Bye.